A uh, very warm welcome to this first webinar produced by the Safeguarding Resource and Support Hub, or the uh, hub as we like to call it. The first in hopefully long series of webinars focused on various aspects of safeguarding that we'll bring to you on a regular basis. Great to see such interest in today's webinar and good to know that the word has spread already about the hub, uh, the fact we have some exciting offers available to the aid and development sector as a whole. Uh, and if, if you want to find out more about the hub, we have a, a podcast that introduces the, the whole program and includes an interview with colleagues from the Department for International Development, which is funding the initiative. My name's Paul Nolan. I'm the Senior Technical Advisor for the Hub and have the uh, very great honour of being the chair for today's webinar. Before we start, just a quick word on housekeeping. <clears throat> so we've placed all of you on mute with videos off, which is to support uh, the quality of the, the broadcast. Uh, but you'll find that chat is enabled uh, and you can contact panellists uh, if you want to raise any issues uh, with tech and our moderator will support you directly on that. If you have any questions relating to the content of the webinar itself, uh, please use the Q&A function. So you should find that in your control panel. Uh, you can add questions. You can also vote on other people's questions. So if you click on the thumbs up next to a question, uh, if it's uh, one that you like, uh, and at the end, the most popular questions will be selected for our Q&A session. Uh, finally, just to mention, we have a closed captioning function as well. Uh, so that will provide you with subtitles for the presentations. Uh, so again, if you go to your control panels, you should see a, a CC a symbol. If you click on that and uh, click on show subtitles, that will allow you to uh, see what we're saying. Uh, you can also change the, the size of the font. Uh, hopefully that will help with uh, accessibility issues. Uh, since we don't have time uh, for all of you to introduce yourselves, we thought at least we would have a quick poll uh, about the organizations you represent uh, so we can all get a sense of who is on the webinar. Um, so we're going to launch that now and just ask you to complete that. Tell us uh, what kind of institution you're coming from. So we'll just give you a few seconds to uh, Tick the appropriate box and then we'll have a look at the results. So there we have the outcome of that. Uh, see mainly an NGO audience. Um, donors and academic institutions represented. Uh, also a good smattering of UN colleagues. Welcome to everyone. Uh, and private sector colleagues as well. So we just want to give you a quick sense of uh, who's on the webinar uh, and some idea of the kind of audiences that uh, we're reaching out to as far as the hub is concerned. So I'm sure you're well aware today's event is looking at the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic for organizations when it comes to safeguarding, especially uh, in relation to sexual exploitation and abuse. So we're aiming to create an opportunity for all of us to learn how we can better respond to the impact of the pandemic on our safeguarding and SEA arrangements. And I, I should say, when we talk about safeguarding, we are uh, referring to the measures organizations need to take to ensure their staff and associates and their operations do no harm and work to prevent sexual exploitation and abuse 
in relation to uh, beneficiaries, affected populations and wider communities. And we have a lot more about uh, what is safeguarding and definitions of uh, sexual exploitation, abuse, sexual harassment on the hub. So please uh, do visit the, the site for more detail on that. We have uh, an excellent panel lined up for you today and they're going to focus on various aspects of safeguarding against SEA. Uh, at this time of global pandemic. And we're going to look at implications for communities, organizations, and specific projects. So we'll, we'll begin by looking at the impacts of the pandemic uh, and what, they've, what that's had on communities and the risks and protection issues that have emerged, especially for children. And we'll hear from Fasil Mariam on the results of a survey conducted across the East Africa region, looking at the impact of COVID-19 and the effects it's had in creating the conditions for SEA to flourish. So FASL has had more than 20 years experience working with disadvantaged children, youth, families and communities and he's founder and executive director of Children's Rights and Violence Prevention Fund and he's based in Kampala, Uganda and they provide grants and technical support to community organizations and local NGOs to prevent violence, sexual abuse and sexual exploitation of children and adolescent girls in Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya and Ethiopia uh, and some of you may know Fassel from his previous role in the Oak Foundation where he was uh, running uh, the East Africa grant making program. We're then going to go on to explore what the pandemic means for risks of sexual exploitation abuse and consider how prevention and response measures uh, including investigations need to adapt to address the new safeguarding risks and challenges posed by COVID-19. And Lucy Heaven Taylor is going to present on this for us. Uh, Lucy's a safeguarding specialist with over 20 years experience in the humanitarian and development sector, including as a PSEA advisor for Oxfam. She now provides consultancy on safeguarding and PSEA to NGOs, governments and UN agencies. And finally, we'll hear about the work of the UN coordinating mechanism in Ethiopia and its response to the COVID-19 crisis from Sylvie Robert. And she'll describe work on a particular project supporting returning migrant workers who are quarantined and particularly the efforts to develop complaints and reporting mechanisms as part of that program. So Sylvie's uh, an independent consultant uh, with 25 years of experience uh, specialising in quality and accountability to affected populations and since 1992 she's worked in complex emergencies in different regions as well as in development contexts and Sylvie's a facilitator and coach and a registered lead auditor, auditor with uh, HQI, the Humanitarian Quality Assurance Initiative and is currently the PSEA coordinator in Ethiopia. So some great speakers and I'm really looking forward to the presentations and learning more about the implications for safeguarding uh, resulting from the COVID-19 crisis. Before I ask our panel to make the presentations, I would just like to reflect briefly on the extraordinary times that we are going through and the impacts it's had on our work and the people that we're trying to support. It's uh, not entirely clear how the COVID-19 pandemic will develop and it's hit some regions and some countries harder than others uh, and in some places it appears to be under control but equally there are predictions of a potentially even more serious second wave of infections to come. We do know of the devastating impact the disease has had and we also have some sense of the increased risks it brings particularly for communities and affected populations already in precarious situations and we'll hear more about that shortly uh, and you know previous pandemics demonstrate the impacts on communities and the way in which risks of sexual exploitation and abuse can increase uh, due to factors such as uh, greater inequality um, reduced service provision greater reliance on aid um, and the influx of first responders for example uh, individuals and groups that are already at risk of SEA, such as those that tend to experience discrimination and are marginalized, will also tend to be at increased risk and the loss of livelihoods for a vast majority of the, of the population may also push people into situations where they are 
more likely to be abused and exploited. So agencies are forced to adapt the way they deliver the programs and also have to meet new challenges of safeguarding from SEA in light of these increased risks and the restrictions and constraints they're now operating on the particular situations of lockdown. And I, I think there's been you know, a hugely impressive response across the sector in terms of organizations producing and sharing guidelines, tools, learning on how to address all of these challenges. And you, you will find a section on the Hub's website dedicated to COVID-19 that brings together various materials uh, and resources that have been developed. Um, and of course, today's webinar is, is another contribution uh, to support the learning on how organizations can better understand and address the safeguarding challenges in the face of the pandemic. So it's time that uh, we moved on, I think, and begin to look at the issues in more detail with the help of our presenters. And I'm going to ask our first panelist, uh, Fasil Mariam, to pick things up from here and to help us consider the changing nature of, of these risks in the communities in which we operate. Fasil, it's over to you, please. Thank you, Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good afternoon. I'd like to take this opportunity to appreciate the webinar organizer for giving me this opportunity to share part of the survey findings that our organization conducted in the region. But before going there, I'd like to say a few words about Children's Right and Violence Prevention Fund, CRVPF. It's a children's right and child right and social justice regional organization founded in April 2015. The organization mission is to prevent violence, the sexual abuse and sexual exploitation of children, adolescent girls, where they live, learn, play and work. CRV partners are community organizations and local NGOs working closely with children, adolescent girls and families and communities. Currently, we have 74 partners in Uganda, Tanzania, Ethiopia, and Kenya. CRVPF developed a cluster partnership model, which we encourage two to five local NGOs and community organizations to work in one geographic area with one grant. We provide six months planning and learning grants to cluster partners, giving them time and space to know each other, their strategies, to identify common project area, to conduct situation analysis, to listen to children, adolescent girls and boys, but at the same time also to develop a, a long-term proposal for CRMPP funding. Next. Next, the survey CRBP conducted a rapid assessment because most of our partners, we have two grant making programs, Violence Prevention Against Children and Adolescent Girls Program. And most of our partners are communicated using WhatsApps. During the COVID-19 lockdown, different level of lockdown in the four countries, our program officers and national consultant conducted a rapid assessment to know the situation. The result of the rapid assessment was not favorable, so we agreed to conduct a survey. The survey used a qualitative approach, and the semi-structured question was, open-ended question was shared online to all our partners using Google Docs. 68 partners participated in the survey, 35 from Uganda, 17 from Tanzania, nine from Ethiopia, and seven from, from Kenya. Children, adolescent girls, parents, and community leaders, as well as partners interview all these actors. The, med, the objective of the survey is to look at broader issues of COVID-19 impact on our partners' work, their work with children, adolescent girls, families, and communities. And it has a broad finding, but for the sake of time and objective of this presentation, I will only focus on the issue of sexual exploitation in the situation of child safeguarding. 
Out of 195 children interviewed by partners, 98% of children and adolescent girls stated they know children and adolescent girls exposed to harassment, rape, and sexual exploitation. In Ethiopia, most of our partners working in the northern Ethiopia informed us that there is a huge increase of child marriage and trafficking and of children for sexual abuse and domestic wars to urban areas and some urban areas. They said that especially concerning child marriage, most of the government structure at community level are focusing on implementing the COVID prevention measures. Families and cultural leaders are pushing children and adolescent girls for child marriage. At the same time, families are also pushing children to traffic so that they can work as domestic work to support their families and also less mouths to feed at household level. In Kenya, our partners working in slum communities indicated that there is a huge increase on sexual harassment and rape. Young people and young men are harassing adolescent girls and children when they went to shops and when they're traveling with their friends. And some of them are forced to sexual relationship. Again, the formal structure of safeguarding structures are not effective and they are more focused on COVID-19 prevention strategies implementation. In Uganda and Tanzania, our partners, young girls, group of young girls who are working in small markets because of the COVID-19, some of those markets are closed and they don't have any customer for their products. Because of this reason, majority of the young girls working in Uganda and Tanzania are involved in washing clothes, employed as domestic works, and some of them are involved in sexual exploitation. And because of this reason, we have developed a system to look at as an intermediary strategies to work, how do we develop and support our partners during this kind of situation? We understood that COVID-19 disrupt the protective measures, environment in which children grow and adolescents develop. Because of this reason, we need to develop a different approach for our partners. As a result, we developed immediate, intermediary and long-term strategies. The immediate strategy is focused on building our partners' resilience to continue safeguarding work in collaboration with other actors. Because we see the disruption of safeguarding structures at community level, the social workers, community leaders, police are more focused on COVID prevention and less attention is given to safeguarding of children and adolescents. We also want to raise awareness of our partners to raise awareness of reporting mechanism among child and adolescent girls using media, child-friendly leaflets and posters. We want them to respond to reported abuse cases and support the apprehending of perpetrators by working with the police and community structures. We also encouraging our partners on ongoing monitoring the status of children and adolescent girls, safeguarding situation. As an intermediary measures, next, uh, we're looking at working with schools and community formal structures. Most of our partners indicated that many of the children in their, you know, under they're working with are not in the community. They are either trafficked, or they are working in domestic work, or, or, are you know, involved in other activities. Because of this reason, they are worried that many children will not return to school when school opens. So we are encouraging our partners to look at mechanism to work with children, families, schools, and communities to encourage children's returning to schools. We're also encouraging our partners to establish right safe child right clubs in schools to safeguard children and adolescent girls. We are also interested in supporting our partners if those children and adolescent girls are not returning, especially the older ones, to do and boys to access placement in some activities, vocational training opportunities, and to give them starting in loan and to start small business activities. 
At community level, we are very much interested our partners to collaborate with community formal leaders, social workers, community police, to encourage and prioritize child safeguarding in addition to COVID prevention. We are interested to support them to look at these issues clearly. Support child safeguarding, reporting and referral pathways. Encourage partners also to establish safe spaces to build children and adolescent girls resilience and agency. This is very important to look at the situation because we are in our new realities. Our partners are saying they don't even know what the new realities of children, adolescent girls, families and communities after COVID. So we are thinking of by preparing our partners We'll be, have, we'll be able to position them to support children and adolescent girls. And in the long term, we're thinking of, in the long term, next, in the long term, we are thinking of developing to understand, to take a research undertaking to understand the new realities of children and adolescents and families in the four countries because of COVID. We are also interested to look at our to review our safeguarding policy and our partners together to understand and include the new reality of children and adults and girls. We are also interested to look at, to review our strategic plan, include, you know, working on, we are mostly working on prevention of violence, but we want to strengthen our safeguarding system in the community. We don't think community organization alone can do this, but they have to collaborate with other actors as well. So we are encouraging our community partners to really look for strategic alliance and strategic partnership with community actors. Lastly, but we are looking at, you know, to collaborate with regional and international global networks of safeguarding organization to share experience and learning on the new realities of children, adolescent girls and their families, and discuss how to respond to the new challenge of safeguarding of children. This is very critical and important. And this is the result of the finding, part of the finding of our survey. But if you are interested to look at the survey, we're going to upload it in our website and you can look at the broader finding of the survey. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much Fasil and beautifully on time. Um, thank you very much for sharing uh, the insights from the survey uh, and the impacts of COVID-19 on communities. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, Lucy now to help us look at uh, some of the implications uh, for organizations working in this kind of context. Um, Lucy, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Paul, and um, thank you also, Fassel, for that really interesting presentation. So Fassel's presentation looked at safeguarding generally in the landscape and how COVID-19 is impacting on it. I want to take a look at a little more detail about safeguarding internal to our own organisations. So how our own organisations can prevent harm that may be caused by coming into contact with our staff and programmes. Now, as part of that, there's a lot to be said on workplace, but I'm not going to focus on that today. I'm going to have a look at harm that we may cause to the affected populations that we work with. This presentation is based on some work that I've done together with a network of NGOs, which was convened by two organisations, Trocra and CAFOD, who were uh, thought it was very important to take a look at how the current COVID-19 Crisis was impacting on their safeguarding work. So we had a series of facilitated discussions where we tried to really drill down and, and look at what practically we can put in place straight away to make sure that our safeguarding measures remain strong. In order to look at what's changed and how we can mitigate against risks, we looked at five specific areas. We focused on programming, operations, who's delivering, referral pathways, and enabling and responding to reports. And it's important to say here and to reiterate what Paul said at the beginning of this webinar, which is this is a very fluid situation. Um, it's a situation we can draw from past experience where we've dealt with uh, previous outbreaks and humanitarian crises, but this is completely new. We've never faced anything like this before. 
and it's also not homogenous. Different countries are in different stages of lockdown or dealing with the situation and it's changing on a rolling week by week basis. So it's very important with what I'm going to say to bear in mind that we need to risk assess now, but we need to keep on risk assessing and looking at how things are changing with the ongoing situation. So what I'd like to do is for each of those five areas that I mentioned to take a look at some example risks that we discussed and some example mitigations that we came up with. Obviously, we're bearing in mind that mitigation measures will change according to uh, your operating environment, the type of work that you're doing and so on. So next slide, please. Thank you. So in, in terms of our programming work, as Fassel's already shared, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has, has had a, a, a massive detrimental effect on safeguarding of uh, the communities that we work with. Also in terms of, uh, of our own assistance community, um, the changes to our programming is also going to exacerbate those risks. So in circumstances where we have to close or suspend essential programs, particularly in the humanitarian context, that obviously means a, a reduction in assistance and therefore riskier coping strategies that affected populations uh, will come up with, which in turn will increase the risk of exploitation by our staff. In terms of mitigation, all we can do really is, is double down and strengthen what we're already doing in terms of safeguarding, uh, with a particular focus on making sure that we're communicating on PSEA to affected populations. Um, given the circumstances, we may be no longer having face-to-face -face contact with affected populations, so we need to look at different ways to communicate with them, for example, through posters and radio programmes. We also need to really uh, strengthen our oversight of, of the staff interaction that we do continue to have with affected populations, being mindful of that increased risk of exploitation. And I'll look at that a little bit more in some further slides. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of our operating models, as I mentioned, this is a, a fluid situation and we're reacting in different ways. We are changing the way that we interact with affected populations and that obviously comes with different risks. So we, we may, in countries uh, that are in lockdown situations, we may see a reduction in face-to-face -face contact with affected populations and that could actually mean that, that a particular risk of exploitation that comes about due to face-to-face -to -face contact will be reduced because our staff are no longer interacting with affected populations. However, if we choose to move, for example, to online activities, with which lots of organisations are doing, there's obviously a different risk profile involved there. And if we're not familiar with working online with uh, children at risk adults affected populations, there may be risks that we need to consider. So the mitigation there would be to make sure that you do develop safeguards that are specific to online interaction. Um, for example, there would need to be codes of conduct that are uh, specific to online activity and also to bear in mind that when you have staff interacting with people online, you should make sure that you have the same oversight, um, the same vetting process that you would for staff who have face to face contact with children and at risk people because the risks um, of online are still there. Next slide, please. So who's delivering? There's a change in operating environment, which means that we are going to be working not only in different ways, uh, but through different stakeholders. So if organisations are choosing to work more remotely in the current context, they might be working increasingly through partners on the ground, or we might be working with new partners and stakeholders because of the changing situation. So in terms of mitigation, we need to be clear that when we are working with, with new stakeholders, that we make sure that we have a common understanding with them on safeguarding and that safeguarding commitments are very clear. They're included in any contracts in terms of reference that we might have with people we're working with. Um, and also if required, that we do provide capacity support to those stakeholders if they need it on safeguarding. Next slide. 
So Fassel has already spoken quite a lot about referral pathways. We obviously need to consider these from the point of view of our own organisations uh, if we become aware of uh, any safeguarding concerns either caused by our own staff or which are disclosed to us in the course of our work. Um, so always with safeguarding, we uh, obviously recommend that you map referral pathways to appropriate services in the locations that you're working in. However, we're obviously finding in the current circumstances, as, as Fassil's already explained, um, that a lot of the, the services that we might refer people to are currently um, either suspended or not operating at full capacity. Um, what we did discuss, though, uh, in, in the conversations that I had with colleagues, is that we do need to, to dig quite deep when we look at our mitigation and find out what actually is still working. So, for example, a, a colleague from Kenya shared that when she did her mapping exercise, she found that uh, for extreme and serious cases, some of the services in Kenya were still operational. So for cases particularly, obviously, involving at-risk children. Uh, so we, we need to, uh, to be sure what the picture is. And uh, again, obviously, uh, with the caveat that it, that it will be changing. Um, I think Sylvie's uh, going to be talking more about some of these issues in her presentation. So next slide, please. So when we're looking at enabling and responding to reports. So first to look at enabling reports. Um, one thing that became clear in our, in our discussions um, and that also we're, we're hearing with other colleagues is that there does seem to have been a reduction or, or even a, a complete drop off of safeguarding reports that are coming through in our organisations. Um, we don't yet know enough to know what the reasons for that are. Um, we need to find out. We can make a few guesses in the meantime that it might be that uh, people don't bother to report safeguarding concerns because they think that maybe we're not fully operational or that um, our attention is on, is on other issues. Um, but it also obviously could well be because our current reporting mechanisms, the way we receive reports into our organisations are not fit for purpose in the current circumstances. Um, so for example, if we usually re receive reports face to face, but we're working in a situation where we're working remotely, um, they're obviously not going to come through to us. So the mitigation is going to be obviously to assess what barriers to reporting there might be in the current situation. If at all possible, we would obviously would consult with affected populations to find out what their barriers are and what would be appropriate ways that they would prefer to report in the new circumstances. Um, and to also to try new routes that don't need face-to-face -face interaction. And um, Fasil already mentioned WhatsApp, which is very widely used in a lot of the contexts that we work in. So is, is WhatsApp an appropriate way to, uh, to receive reports um, and also to be, to be clear that that's secure and also obviously that your staff are trained in, in how to deal with reports and disclosures that may come through WhatsApp and to ensure that they're followed up properly. Next slide, please. So responding to reports when they do come in, particularly concerns raised that involve our own staff um, might require further investigation. Um, in our discussions, it, it became clear that um, it's becoming increasingly difficult to investigate safeguarding reports against our staff in the ways that we traditionally do so. So if organisations are working remotely and staff are not able to visit a site, um, that makes it obviously a lot harder to investigate or to follow up on a safeguarding report. So an example mitigation would be to consider whether we can undertake remote investigations. For example, interviewing witnesses over Skype. Um, if we do decide to work in that way, then obviously this does need to be risk assessed. Um, when we interview over Skype, we need to be uh, sure that our witness at the other end is in a secure location, that there's nobody else in the room that we can't see, um, that they feel safe, and that obviously when that interview ends, particularly if we've been talking about distressing issues, that there is support available for them when they conclude that interview, even if we're not physically present on site. Um, something interesting that came up in our discussions uh, was that um, some people were, were reporting that uh, witnesses were saying to them that they actually prefer remote investigations uh, because it feels safer for them and it's a lot easier to keep confidential than it would be if uh, you have an investigation team turning up on site. So that's, that's an overview of uh, the discussions that we had. Obviously, it was a very rich discussion and uh, lots of different issues came up. Um, so that this is only 
um, a, a representation of some of the things that came up. But, um, but I, I, I hope that you find it useful. Um, it's also worth mentioning that we base the discussions on lots of resources that are already out there and that you can find on the hub, such as the plan investigation guidelines, uh, the global mentoring initiatives, checklist on safeguarding and uh, lots of other resources that are, that are available. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Lucy. Uh, good to get a sense of some of the uh, sort of real risk issues that people are grappling with and practical suggestions about uh, how to address some of those. Um, we're going to move to our final speaker. Just a quick reminder to all participants, if you want to ask any questions as we go along, anything that you're hearing and you want a little bit more detail on or you want to raise a question about, uh, please just use the Q&A function, uh, drop a question in there and we'll come back to it at the end. Um, time to move on to Sylvie now. Um, I'm going to ask Sylvie to take us through, again, getting into some more of the practical detail about uh, dealing with issues in a particular location, particular program area. Uh, and Sylvie is talking to us from Addis today. Thanks, Sylvie. So you're on mute, Sylvie. Good morning, good morning, afternoon, evening to, to everybody. I'm calling from Maris, Ethiopia. I'll probably put my video off in a few seconds to ensure that there is no breakout of the connection and we'll try to put it back at the end. Um, so I'm currently the PSEA coordinator here in Ethiopia, contracted by UNICEF and based at the UN Resident Coordinator Office, the RCO. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, I would like to start with this quick overview, highlighting our humanitarian structure and framework here in country, which is reflecting our global commitments on PSEA by humanitarian actors and our mandatory accountability lines. Um, we are right now reviewing our strategy, our PSEA strategy for Ethiopia. Just a second, yeah. Um, which is encoded at the DHCT, the Humanitarian Country Team. We are also working to ensure a strong and significant membership to the PSEN network, which is hosting a bit more than 25 members um, of, uh, well, uh, coming from various origins and type. We have UN agencies, NGOs, uh, donors, and government representatives coming in right now. And our approach is really to enforce an interagency uh, strategy and work plan, which reflects a people-centered approach and enables full respect and dignity of the people and communities benefiting from humanitarian and uh, development assistance and protection. Mm, next slide. So what I would like to share here um, is a very concrete and practical example of the work we've been uh, conducting since few weeks. This example is, um, is linked to an unexpected situation due to the current uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. And we've been launching a, a joint initiative. We've identified a few weeks ago a new group at risk composed of thousands of migrant returnees uh, coming back from the neighboring countries in East Africa and from the Middle East. We, at the same time, we identified higher risks of SEA uh, and, and GBV, uh, in particular due to uh, those um, people vulnerability, access issues, limited access to services, and uh, also the involvement of new actors in providing assistance and protection who might not have been uh, trained and may not be fully aware of our global commitments and, and principles. Um, I think this, this was framed really clearly by both Facil and Lucy earlier. Um, so based on this, we adopted a joint approach. I would say a joint attitude. Um, and we've decided, next slide please, we decided 
to work jointly on PSEA and AAP perspectives and ensure that because we do see PSEA SEA as a bridge of accountability to affected populations, we would have a holistic approach. Um, we formed a team uh, made of actors involved in the quarantine centers hosting the migrant returnees back here in country. Uh, this team was composed of a number of UN agencies and NGOs, and we worked under the leadership of IOM, who was and is the agency mandated to coordinate it, to coordinate the assistance in the quarantine centers. Um, and it is the agency being granted access to the people. We work jointly with the Interagency Accountability Working Group here in country and the PSEN network and provided guidance to this whole group of actors to first assess the situation, assess the risks in terms of uh, potential SEA slash GBV and um, assess the possibility and our capacity to launch uh, proper complaint and feedback mechanisms. So that uh, led to an assessment uh, we conducted a few weeks ago. And I would like to drive you through our findings briefly. Next slide, please. Yeah. We organized our findings through three main chapters. So very concretely, one chapter was about quick actions required. And typically, this would be preventive or pro protective uh, quick actions, highlighting what could be done quickly by the actors in place to ensure the best possible protection of this specific group. As a very practical example, it would be putting locks, uh, ensuring that there would be locks on the doors of the individual rooms, uh, ensuring that there would be light at night, ensuring at another level that all actors having access to those people in the quarantine centers would be uh, sensitized on um, our responsibilities towards PSEA as those are just few examples. And then we had two other sets of findings. One was around what we call the one way information and communication. One way actions we had to put in place um, to ensure that these uh, migrant return returnees in the quarantine centers would receive um, information about their situation, the rights and entitlements, as well as uh, proper, proper mechanisms to report any um, uh, misconduct. The two-way aspect is the third set of uh, findings, and the two-way aspect led us to uh, start uh, designing complaints and feedback mechanism. And this is definitely linked to uh, our AAP principles, accountability to affected populations principles. How do we ensure that we give a voice to people and enable them to feed back to us, to share their views and to complain um, if, if, uh, if necessary. Um, so that led us to the work we are doing now uh, around having a single joint complaint and feedback mechanism. And again, this is to respect our people-centered approach. We don't want to have in quarantine centers several mechanisms in place. We want to have one and we want it to be functional. And this is where the difficult aspect started. Um, but, but this is also where we are really useful and where this is absolutely needed. We are now working on the encourage of this mechanism uh, together with the actors involved and with uh, ensuring linkages with the government-led coordination mechanism. We are also in the process of drafting SOPs, and here we heard a lot about the referral mechanisms before, but this means for us now that we need to rely on the GBV services available, and it means that we have to work out those services and, and, and ensure that they are 
um, functional and appropriate and safe enough uh, so that we can refer to those. Mm, we're going to pilot a mechanism in uh, one quarantine center through a small committee, which is the way that has been um, highlighted as the preferred mean by the people in the quarantine centers. So this, this will be the way to, to, to enforce the mechanism. Um, and the other step for us now is to replicate this assessment to sensitize actors, multi-sectoral teams working in the regions and country to run such assessments, uh, take this into account and, and, and replicate. This is happening this week throughout the country. So we are now working with the government-led mechanism um, and the UN coordination uh, mechanisms to ensure that this um, type of approach is replicated in the regions where we have quarantine centers uh, mushrooming in, in, in very remote areas, remote places. Mm, I would um, like to emphasize here that beyond the finding, findings, the, the most important has been here uh, and beyond the actions, the most important has definitely been here this collective approach taken by a number of actors working in a same location with a certain uh, group of people. And it's taking time. It's not an, a, a very fast process, but it is key in terms of doing no harm, respecting people, ensuring that we have, again, this people-centered approach in place um, and, and making it functional in the medium term. I think it's, it's really a good example of ensuring sustainability. So it takes a bit more time to set up if you look through collectively, but it's sustainable, it's more sustainable, and it has more chances to be uh, operational. I would like to end up here and uh, leave space for questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Sylvie. We do have um, some time for questions and answers at this point, um, but I'd, I'd just like to thank uh, our presenters. Um, if anyone has any specific questions for them, uh, please feel free to add those to the Q&A uh, box or uh, you can do that through the chat. We have a few questions. Uh, I'll just give you a chance to um, uh, ask any other questions uh, while I respond to a couple of, uh, two or three questions actually about accessing materials uh, related to the webinar. Uh, there will be a recording of the webinar and that will go on to uh, the Hub uh, website. So uh, that will be available uh, shortly afterwards. So you'll be able to access the whole recording of this session. Um, we have questions for um, Fasil and Lucy about whether it's possible to access uh, reports based on their presentations. Um, I don't know if you want to respond very quickly to say whether they're likely to be published and whether we can uh, place those on the hub uh, potentially uh, to add to our resources. Can I? Uh, our report will be in our website when the final report is completed. So anyone interested can look at our website next week and then they'll find the reports. Great, thanks, Fasil. Hi, this is Lucy. Um, there was no report developed as a result of that work because um, it was more facilitated discussions, um, more kind of snapshot in time as to what we can do now. Um, however, I know that on the COVID-19 page of the Hub, there are lots of resources uh, that cover a lot of the, the issues that, uh, that I spoke about. So if people want to take a look there, I think a, a lot of it's covered off. Great, thanks, Lucy. Um, we have a question for Sylvie uh, specifically, uh, asking about um, how the findings were received by government partners 
and will the recommendations uh, be scaled up to other quarantines? Is there any uh, planned initiative on that? Sylvie. Yes, definitely. We have, uh, well, we have meetings today and tomorrow through the government-led uh, um, coordination mechanism where we will present uh, the findings and the current process and discuss how we do work together. The other um, action we are having jointly is that we are, um, we've made ourselves available to brief the teams who will run the assessments in the regions uh, throughout this week and uh, guide this process. So we, we are ensuring again sustainability and uh, coherence as, as we go through this and work together. Thank you. Thanks Sylvie. Uh, and while you're there we have another question about whether uh, you have examples of complaints during this period. Well, I think one of the principles we highlighted and we work with is confidentiality. Um, so it's important to respect that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions, I think, aimed at Lucy uh, in particular, which are asking about experience of uh, different organizations and examples of where their safeguarding responses uh, are working well in, in the way that you described. So other examples of where particular risks um, have been responded to, uh, also including the uh, online safeguarding you, you mentioned, other examples of that or organizations that you feel are particularly strong when it comes to uh, dealing with some of those new online safeguarding risks. Generally speaking, um, in terms of organisations that are responding well, I think there's there's uh, lots of good practice across the sector, um, including obviously it was Troker and Cafford who I was speaking to. Um, but bearing in mind the fact that this is such a changeable situation that a lot of what I've been talking about, um, it suggested mitigation, but um, we, we haven't had much time to to really test out what works and what doesn't in these circumstances. So really, it's more about organisations having that lens and making sure that they are reassessing their, their safeguarding implementation in, in the current situation. Um, in terms of online safeguarding, um, I'm aware of guidance that's been developed internal to organisations, but I'm, I'm not sure what is out there and shared in the public domain. So I've just been discussing uh, with the, um, the, the hub folk as to whether we can get some, some resources on the hub and they're, they're going to look into that. So hopefully we should have something to share there. Okay, thank you, Lucy. We have um, a question, I'm not sure who might pick this up, but uh, it's about evidence or examples of uh, SEAH risks having decreased through implementation of social protection programming in response to COVID. Anyone with any specific uh, insight on that? We're not social protection specialists. Um, I don't know if anyone has any awareness of whether that's something that's been effective. It seems not. We may have to uh, leave that question for now. Any further questions people would like to post at this point? I've seen one in the chat actually, which is uh, about, again, going back to online uh, activity and uh, how can we ensure safeguarding of adolescents and especially their confidentiality from their parents? I think, um, again, maybe if, if I pick this up uh, and you will find some uh, resources on this on uh, the hub, if you go to uh, the Safeguarding Support Hub website, um, 
there's a lot of work being done on online safety uh, and a lot of e-safety guidance that's been produced by quite a number of organizations. Uh, some that's aimed at organizations and thinking about online risks within their organizations, uh, but some directed specifically at uh, parents and children and young people. Uh, so there is a lot of advice about uh, the risks and about online safety uh, and how you can try and deal with some of those things and issues around confidentiality and uh, negotiating that relationship between uh, parents and children. Uh, uh, there's quite a lot of material out there and if you visit the, uh, the Hub website you will see some of that. So on that note, I think um, we probably need to uh, end the presentations uh, and the, uh, the webinar at that point. Please don't um, leave at this point. We have a couple of polls we'd like you to, uh, to complete. Um, just a, a quick reminder that, um, as I said, there's a lot more on safeguarding generally, but specifically on COVID-19. Uh, at the Hub's website. Uh, you can subscribe to the, the newsletter. Uh, the, the first newsletter uh, went out in May and that was on the theme of COVID-19 and that will also signpost you to a lot of uh, great tools and resources that you can look at. Um, so that's on uh, safeguardingsupporthub.org forward slash COVID. Um, so we're going to launch a couple of polls. We'd really like to get some kind of evaluation, find out what you thought of our first webinar. Uh, as I said, we're going to be uh, producing these on a regular basis, so it'd be good for us to have some feedback and learn about uh, how we can improve. Uh, so we have the first poll here, if you could give us some strong uh, good feedback, that would be really helpful. Uh, and you'll also see there's a second one, which is about uh, future webinars. We have another webinar coming up uh, next month in July, which is exploring the question of, uh, can we trust the aid sector to keep people safe? Uh, but we have others planned and we'd really like to get a bit of input from you uh, just to see what you think might be a, a good theme for us to, to choose. These polls are all uh, anonymous, so there's no uh, identification of who's answering what in relation to these uh, poll questions. So please feel free to uh, make your opinion known. Uh, I also mentioned earlier we have uh, a podcast. So we produced uh, our first podcast last month as well. And that will tell you a lot more about the hub. We had a question about um, helping people to understand a bit more about the hub and about how to navigate uh, the hub. Uh, so you can get a bit more background from the podcast. We also have new uh, material arriving at the Hub on a regular basis, some of which will be specifically designed to help people explore uh, the tools and resources and the various supports that are available uh, through the Hub. Um, so please do continue to visit. Uh, we'll give you some uh, guides uh, to help you navigate around and find the kind of things that you're looking for. Um, but hopefully if you search on what you're looking for through the search function, uh, that should help you uh, find your way to uh, the resources that you're looking for. So thank you very much for uh, participating today. Thank you for sharing your opinion around uh, on the, the poll and about future events. Thank you in particular to uh, our panelists. Um, it was fantastic to have, um, so we have the, uh, the second poll up for you there as well. Uh, it was really great to have uh, such a, an array of speakers for our first webinar, um, talking about their particular insights in relation to safeguarding and COVID-19. Um, we'll have some more panelists for the next uh, webinar next month. Um, and as I say, there's a lot more about future activities on the, the website. So please visit there and find out uh, what uh, we have as far as forthcoming events are concerned. Thank you very much again for your attendance, for your participation, your contributions in terms of questions. 
and responses to our polls. Um, and I hope you found something useful today, something that will help you reflect on uh, your own safeguarding arrangements and dealing with some of the challenges presented by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so thank you and hope you uh, will attend the next webinar. Uh, look forward to staying in touch with you uh, through the website as well.